For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marianne Ralph, and I'm the director here at the library. Um, it's my great pleasure actually to be the moderator this evening for our panel discussion. As you can imagine, librarians are very concerned about um, the phenomenon now known as fake news. Um, for decades, library librarians have been you know, teaching children and adults how to get good information, how to get verified information, how to assess information. So this is one of our classic roles, really. And so I, in particular, felt very strongly because when I was a, when I was a brand new librarian, the first grant that I ever wrote was for teen services. And I was awarded it. And what I did was I had sessions. This was back in 1999 when the internet first came. It was fairly new to libraries and we had public computers. And I worked with teens to talk with them about how to vet information online, digital information. And it was really eye-opening to me that there wasn't an immediate transfer of skills for them for how they vetted information in print and what they get on the computer. You know, it was a lot of, well, somebody took the time to make this web page. And so it was very eye-opening for me. And so since that, since the very beginning of my career, um, this has always been something that has resonated with me. So uh, Sharon and I um, came up with this idea to have this panel and discuss of why right now, like, why is this happening? right now? Why is it this you know, phenomenon? Why do we keep hearing fake news? And why is mainstream media a negative term? So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists this evening. Um, right next to me is Lori Harding. She is the head of instructional services at the Bunn Library at the Lawrenceville School. Next is Joe Umansky. He is the managing editor of the West Windsor Plainsboro News. Next, right next to him is Terry Huggins Hart. She is a freelance journalist, writer, and blogger. And at the end of our table is Professor Matthew Coaches. He is assistant professor of English and journalism at Mercer Community College. And he is also the faculty advisor to the college paper, The College Voice. So I'm going to start off um, with my first question. And you guys, I'm going to let you guys just jump in. But why is this happening now? So why all of a sudden is there this phenomena of fake news making headlines? Well, you know, I think it has a lot to do with the spread of social media. Fake news has always existed. And it comes from many sources. Some people do it because they have an agenda. Some people do it because they are misunderstood. Um, and other people, they just don't realize where the source is coming from. And a lot of it is um, satire. There's a lot of um, websites like theonion.com, and people are making joke articles. Somebody who doesn't realize it's a joke or actually read the, you know, the fine print that this is satire, sends that out, somehow it goes viral, and then we spread it, and that's how we have our fake news. So it's, it's always been around. It's just a bit more uh, prevalent now because of the spread of social media. And um, to add on to what Terry said, I would say is access. We have a newspaper in our phone all the time, and having cellular phones really does push whatever information our way. And when we don't take the time to evaluate what information comes in, and we're just constantly being bombarded at every single moment, uh, I usually sit down with my class with an actual newspaper, and we talk about how does it function? How do you read a newspaper? Do you actually read every single word first to the very end? No, that takes too much time. What you do is you evaluate it. You look at the headlines, you read the first couple of sentences, and you get through the newspaper in about five to eight minutes. Well, how do you teach that type of skill when you're constantly being bombarded by headlines on your phone and through social media? And it becomes prevalent that this existence of fake news is going to get thrown into the mix. One of the things that I think is sort of important to uh, think about when you're talking about fake news is sort of what is fake news, right? I mean, this term gets sort of thrown around a lot. And so I think there's um, a number of different silos that sort of get called fake news. And so obviously, if you're talking about um, 
someone in Russia churning out fake stories saying, you know, Pizzagate or something like that. That's sort of definitely one silo in terms of fake news that has a particular agenda attached to it, whether it be financial, political, or, or something else. But then you also really have how quickly the news cycle seems to turn on a dime. Um, I often say to my students, Think of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Imagine social media was around during the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, you used to have time, time for the news cycles to flesh things out and verify, and now everything, the news, uh, the news agencies are in competition with each other. It's who can get the first scoop. I need to report on this if it's true. True or not, we can always do a correction after the fact. There's such a rush to get it out and get it out first that I think there's definitely this, this fake news that's really just news that hasn't run through the proper checkpoints that 5, 10, 15, 100 years ago were, was there. And so I think when we talk about it, it's sort of like we're fighting a multi-headed enemy that, that you know multiple things get sort of attached to this particular you know, of fake news. So there's a number of reasons for the various ones, but you know, it sort of gets this all-encompassing umbrella. And that's, you know, that's interesting. This, you know, there is a push, right? Like everything's in real time. Like this is happening in real time. We have somebody on the ground in real time as it's unfolding. And I think that that also talks to like sources, like how we use sources. And I'm gonna. Um, call on you, Joe, because this was one thing that you felt particularly strong about um, when we were preparing for this, and that how um, journalism and journalists use sources, how they present them, the lack of presenting them, so I'm going to let you touch on that. Uh, I think one of the things that's become interesting to me in the, in the recent news cycle, and it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, you're affected by this one way or the other, and it has to do with where is the news coming from? People aren't necessarily thinking about where the people that we say we trust got the news. Uh, because sometimes the people that we trust to bring us the news that we believe are subject to some of the same biases that we might have. Uh, I always come back to an example that happened that not too long after the last election. North Carolina had um, switched over to uh, a, a de democratic majority in their Supreme Court, even as, uh, and they also, even as the, uh, they had a supermajority in their legislature. Um, and so the, I think it was either the Charlotte Observer or the Raleigh, uh, the Raleigh News, they had a story that said that uh, the idea had been floated uh, of changing their number of Supreme Court justices from seven to nine so that there could be another vote and the Republicans could get a majority where they had, had previously not had a majority. So what I did was, I said, this doesn't even sound right. I looked at the story and I went through the story and I read every quote in the story to see where it came from. Who was saying it? Was it sourced from a human being uh, who would give their name? Or was it someone who was talking about background? Couldn't give their name. Uh, I looked for others, often, especially today, a lot of news sources use other news sources for their sources. <laughs> so uh, that's how a snowball gets rolling. What I found about this story was very interesting. As it turns out, the uh, reporter that was reporting that the idea had been floated of changing the number of justices in North Carolina was quoting a fellow reporter from the same newspaper. When I read that article, I traced where that source was. That was an editorial in the same newspaper. An editorial is not a news story. An editorial is an opinion story. So we very quickly had a story that had a lot of people very upset that had no basis in fact whatsoever. What do we mean when we say someone floated an idea? Somebody had a thought. <laughs> so. Um, one of the things that I find when you're going crazy with the news, if you feel like what you're reading doesn't make sense or it makes you crazy, take a look at where the news comes from. Uh, it's something that anybody can do, um, and you have to want to do it, and, and it may take a little bit of work. But see where everything's coming from. When somebody says that the New York Times reported it, go look at the New York Times article. When the New York Times says the LA Times reported it, follow that to the LA Times article, and so on and so forth, until you find where the actual origin of this quote is, and see if you then trust that source or think that that uh, is something that you believe or want to follow up on. So. Uh, 
Joe, I really like what you do. I actually have my students do the same thing. I give them a bunch of uh, news outlets and I tell them, okay, take the first headline on there. And each of them has their own article and they have to count how many quotes there are in their article as well as how many sources are there. And then we have this discussion of what makes that article better than the other articles. And we start evaluating it based on the sources alone. And it's really important that you evaluate your sources because if you don't evaluate your sources, it could be coming from anywhere or anyone. And that's from you. Well, and just to um, continue on that being of, you know, newspapers citing other newspapers, and um, I think that if you, we bring in social media, if we come back to social media, it's, well, if so-and-so, if my friend Mary is sending this to me, like, well, it must be true because, you know, Mary's a good person and we think alike. And I think that social media has that echo chamber effect. And that it's sort of, we people feel that like, well, it's pre-vetted because my friend or all these people on my Facebook feed, you know, they, one of them has had to have looked at it. And so, you know, I don't need, you know, there's not that, that thought to be like, oh, let me, let me think a little bit more critically about this just because somebody I know passed it along, it doesn't mean that it, it's any more credible than if somebody else that you didn't know passed it along. And one thing that I do want to touch on is something that you have brought up, Lori, about there are actually different types of fake news. And I think um, I would like to hear all of your thoughts because I do think that now that this has been in the, the fake news has been in the news so much. There is this idea of now people actually trying to say, well, this is fake news, but this isn't fake news. And how do you like parse, like, let's talk about the different types there are, and also like, how do you parse through that? Like people trying to convince you that what I'm saying is not fake news, but what they're saying is fake news. And on top of that, I'm just asked to think about when we have national leaders saying, this is fake news, or that's fake news, or one national leader saying it's fake news, another national leader saying it's not fake news. You know, how do we process all this? And so I just threw a lot at you, so just go crazy. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a stab at it. Um, when I think about the idea of how people approach their sources and what they choose to believe, um, I feel one of the areas that is often overlooked is the role of psychology. And we, we assume that people are rational beings, but in reality, most people make their decisions based on emotion. Um, we're all prone to confirmation bias. Uh, we all suffer from cognitive dissonance. And I always give the analogy, I apologize if there's any New England Patriots fans in, in the room. Um, my director is a huge New England Patriots fan, and, and so I will, when I'm talking to students, often say, listen, I can talk with Mrs. Clancy about how the New England Patriots, in my mind, have cheated, lied, <laughs> um, basically broke every rule to sort of, you know, amass the amount of wins that they've had. But she is a diehard fan. She will not believe it. Um, much like my husband, who is a Philadelphia Eagles fan, will tell you that he totally had it coming with the snowball incident. I mean, so, <laughs> and so what I'm reminded of is just that facts don't always persuade people. So we need to be mindful of the fact that um, we have a number of things just as human beings that we're already sort of struggling with when we're looking at these types of things. And so um, just giving people facts isn't always the, the easiest thing. I mean, we are sort of uh, conditioned to find things that are unpleasant. Uh, we, not, we try not to think about them. You know, we, we don't want to. We don't want to deal with them. We're evolutionarily designed to prioritize sort of a groupthink mentality. And so a lot of this fake news is actually that team versus this team. And so they're putting this out and it goes against what I feel. And so additionally, when you're on your social media site, much like when you're on the web, the internet knows everything about you. I mean, there's this wonderful <laughs> book out called Every, Everybody Lies. I don't know if you've heard of it, which basically says that if you want to know what people really think, Google knows, because people put things into Google that they won't tell their best friend, they won't tell their spouse, right? I mean, like, we, every, in the middle of the night when we're worried about something, it's like, Google, please tell me what happened. <laughs> um, 
And so I guess what, what, that, what that says to me is that like we are sort of hyper sorting ourselves into these little niches where all we sort of come in contact with are things that we already believe. And if we find something that's unpleasant, we don't even want to think about it. We just sort of want to intensify why that particular person is wrong. And that's extraordinarily dangerous for a democracy. That's extraordinarily dangerous to have any kind of actual discourse on, on anything. And so before we can even start to talk about why I feel Fox News is right or why I feel the New York Times is right or anything that's on that spectrum, we need to sort of be aware of what our own shortcomings are as human beings looking at information and deciding what we believe. And so I feel that if people are aware of that, it's at least a good step in a way of how you actually approach all of those things that you're saying. Like, oh, my, you know, and with social media, what, it's fast, right? It's easy. Um, it looks good. It looks right? good, right? I mean, seriously, who's not against cancer, right? I mean, like, yes. Yeah, so it, a lot of this is sort of just built into not having us have to think a little bit about why we feel the way we do. And I feel that if people are at least aware of it and can sort of make a conscious effort to think about how to combat that, that's the best first step in terms of how I would approach dealing with anything that sort of gets under fake news. But all the suggestions. That, that they've given so far about you know checking your sources and seeing where the quotes have come from and you know trying to get it down to the granular level if it's the primary source that actual research report that came in the actual speech that was given you know whatever they're actually reporting on that's but again it's time and, you know yeah. you know to add to that what I've learned when um, a lot of news stories report things they use things that um, have very broad definitions. Um, for example, there's the whole health care uh, reform coming on. I remember seeing on the news that everybody was saying, oh, this is bad because the wealthy gets a tax break. And that spreads, which may be true, but how are they defining wealthy? Everybody's saying, oh, well, why do billionaires need a tax break? We don't know if that's how they're defining wealthy. How about you actually go break down the bill, see what these words are actually defined as, and you know, regardless of what your political view is on it, find out what they're talking about. A lot of the times these words are already have a bias and you don't realize it. You're already, you know, being given an agenda. So it's up to you to sit there and say, okay, so what exactly is this news organization, you know, defining as wealthy? What are they defining as poor? Don't just go with, oh, they said that the wealthy are getting a tax break, so it's horrible, or the poor are gonna get this much, so it's horrible. You know, we actually have to sit there and define and figure out what they're talking about. And I think that's how a lot of fake news starts. I mean, people think they know what they're talking about. Next thing you know, somebody has this new post on Facebook. You know, my billionaire uncle is getting a tax break on health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> $30,000 in debt. And, you know, that's how it starts. You know, we don't know what they're actually talking about. So I think in one way, it's, it's not really good at the news organizations to spin that bias. It may not be intentional. But it's it's sort of a, a shortcut on their part, and that's you know part of the problem with fake news spreading. It, it also occurs, and Joe, when you were talking about your uh, analogy there, where you were talking about it started off as an editorial, it's also understanding there's multiple actual news uh, variances too. There's different types of news. There's features. There's hard news. There's sports. There's reviews and op eds. But what has come to this point in time is when you're watching television, some of those start to bleed into each other, where you don't recognize, is this sports or is this a sports op-ed piece? Is this a review or is this hard news? And when it starts blurring, whereas in the newspaper, these are very clearly identifiable. Where are the hard news? Front of the page. Where are the reviews? At the end. Why? Because we very clearly identify what is a priority in the newspaper. But we can't do that so much with social media and on television, where it's about entertainment, ratings. Even when you're looking at your local news, how many times do you have a commercial break in before they even actually finish saying what they're saying on the news? Go to ABC News, what is the last story? It's either about a puppy, it's about a family member or a soldier, it's something that is purposely tear-jerker that's supposed to make you feel good at the end of it. It's very formulaic. And in some ways, yes, that's good, but it's also very entertaining. It leaves you at the end feeling very good about yourself. But if you know how to distinguish these different types of articles, actual news, not fake news, then you'll be able to go, oh, wait, they're starting to put bias in that. That's an op-ed piece. That's not a hard news. Okay? 
Whereas if you read the newspaper, it's a lot different on how that functions. It's one of the things that at the beginning for my students, it's not even getting them to distinguish fake news and news, it's getting them to read the news. Getting them to come in and at the beginning of every single class, okay, let's talk about the news, what's making the headlines, what's national. At the end of the semester, they already have all the apps checking out all the different types of news. That's one issue that when it comes to fake news, you don't even know how to identify it at that point in time. So it starts bleeding into each other that we need a little bit of education to know what news is to help us understand to identify what fake news is. You know, that really goes back, I mean, it's sort of very old school in a way, <laughs> but, you know, back when I was in school, um, you did, you know, I remember learning that. Like, I remember going to the library and you went through, you know, how um, to figure out, like, where to find the information, like how to use indexes and how to, you know, vet what you're seeing and also, um, how to sort of check it versus other print sources, right? So you get your primary sources and then you get your secondary sources and you can sort of vet them against one another. And it was, you know, especially when you're little, it was very easy to get that all on a table in the library in front of you. And now there is this sort of infinite, you know, there's no way you could get, you know, everything in front of you on a table in the library. And it does make it really difficult, but it also makes, what I think compounds it is, you know, just forget about digital, but like cable news. Like it was very difficult to, you know, in 1950, you sort of had your standard news. You had your newspapers, your multiple newspapers, and you had your, your mainstream news media. And now you can go to a channel on cable that's for people who like poodles and dancing in the rain. And that's all you care about, and that's your channel. And that didn't exist, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And I think that that definitely leads to that echo chamber effect. And I think, I think it was President Obama's one of his last speeches where he sort of told people, you know, you have to get out of your bubble. You know, every, every once in a while, it's, it's really good for our democracy for everybody to get out of their bubble because it's so easy for us now, compared to years past, to stay in our bubble. So, you know, how do, how do we get people to get out of their bubble? <laughs> <laughs> they can't all be easy questions. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that I like to do is test myself on my objectivity or my, um, for example, one of the things we do when, when one of our points of view is challenged or what I like to do at, uh, in our uh, newsroom is, is when somebody brings up a point of view that was different from what we've been saying or what we believe to say, well, is there something to that? Are we, are we overlooking something? Um, I always, to teach myself lessons about this being a journey, uh, of understanding news and, and, and truth, whatever that may be. Um, I think about baseball, and I think about um, how baseball has changed in the last 10 years. Believe it or not, it's changed because of news. It's changed because of data. Uh, and and uh, there's a guy named Bill James who's kind of famous back in the 70s and 80s, and he was working as like a janitor or something like that. He came up with crazy ideas, like RBIs are, are meaningless statistic in baseball and everybody said what this guy's crazy he doesn't know what he's talking about but he he went through it and he reasoned it out and he said RBIs are just a function of guys being on base when you bat and get a base hit and I remember reading this and being upset myself <laughs> and saying come on RBI is the most important statistic but the more I thought about it and the more people this is the more important part the more people said Bill James is right RBIs are a function of luck and, and, and circumstance I had to start to say either I'm going to say all these people who've thought about this are just all wrong or I'm wrong. And I think with news, with fake news, with, with one of the big things, challenges that we face is challenging our own assumptions. I think that when we hear news, and it, you, you've talked about the news in our pockets or you know the, the chyrons at the bottom of TV, they call those. 
uh, you can't stop. You go to the restaurant, you go to the airport, you go to the store. I was in the dentist, literally the dentist this morning, and there was news on the screen. I couldn't get away from it. Um, you can't get away from it. We used to be able to turn off. We used to be able to, I, I, I'm not, I'm overstimulated, I don't get this. I'm not gonna read this story anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna, but you can't get away from it anymore. You can't get away from the guy saying that RBIs are worthless. Um, now there's baseball players who are stars because someone said, if you always try to hit a fly ball, you will get a better batting average. Everybody knows that's ridiculous. You don't try to hit fly balls, but it turns out you do try to hit fly balls. So if, you, if you're willing to listen to the news and accept that sometimes it may be something that you don't inherently believe or that you didn't want to hear, um, if you can consider it, you might just find your point of view changing. I think that's the only real way out of the bubble that I know. So is this something that would be, um, you know, in education we talk about critical thinking, right? We're always, we're trying to develop these critical thinkers because that's what we need, you know, going ahead. So for me as a librarian, you know, I feel that um, what we call information literacy, which I grant you is a horrible term, but what, what that means is teaching people, children, students, how to vet their information, how to look at it and how to challenge themselves, right? And how to challenge their own thoughts on this idea. So is that something, you know, especially that we need, you know, from my point of view as a librarian, well, it's like that's why we need librarians in, in our schools. Like this is why the, the library is not optional. You know, we can call the room whatever you want. But we need somebody that is sort of dedicated to this and works hand in hand with the teachers. And you know, over the years since I've been in New Jersey, a lot of schools have lost their librarians. And that is sort of the, the to me, you know, from my experience growing up and my experience being a, a librarian, that is the role. That is a role that um, was it was a unique role in the school and the and Lori, feel free to jump in, but that was like the thing that the, the, li the, the teacher saw the librarian as a resource too, to help the students um, that they could partner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I think um, the baseball analogy that you bring up is really interesting because baseball is something that's important to you. You said those things and I said, yeah, that might be true. Like, I'm not a huge baseball fan. So, <laughs> and, and so this sort of ties into, it's easier for us to accept opposing ideas to things that we're not emotionally attached to, right? So, you know, I don't really know that much about baseball. I'm willing to take that that's true, but if it was something that I was extraordinarily passionate about, and you're saying something that's the complete opposite, it goes to that part of my brain where I feel like I'm being attacked. And when people feel like they're being attacked, they're not receptive to being, uh, to listening to, to anything. So what I try to, uh, what I try to hope for the students that I see, obviously critical thinking, you know, the whole information literacy, learning how to evaluate your sources, extraordinarily important um, because sooner or later you're going to be in a career where you're going to be asked to ask why you believe what you believe. But, but beyond that, when we're talking about on a more macro level, um, one of the pieces of information that came out in the last year that I'm sort of like hanging my hat on because a lot of this I find really depressing um, <laughs> is the idea that one of the best ways to fight this sort of uh, partisan bubble is to be, uh, they call it scientific curiosity, but I think it sort of gets into intellectual curiosity. People who are naturally curious tend to be open to a lot of different ideas. And so in addition to sort of instilling, like evaluate your sources, I try to instill, don't be so set that you know everything. Like go through your life always saying, I could be wrong. What's, what's, why do people think that way? Like if you, can, if you can harness that curiosity through your entire life, I feel like it's a lot easier that you have ideas, you don't have these core beliefs that you can't let go of. And so I'm, I'm hopeful for, for curiosity. Um, the other thing that I think is extraordinarily important is just asking questions and listening. Um, I, have a, I have a son who's almost two, and so he asks a lot of questions. And so I learned her along with my daughter that answering them is not the easiest way. You just say, so why do you think that? So why do you think that? So why do you think that? Because what you're really trying to get people to understand is that in the grand scheme of things, we're all on the same team. And so if I can begin to sort of 
build a repertoire with you about saying, you know, we're all Americans, or we're all concerned about what healthcare should be, or we're all concerned about, you know, what the change in climate might have to do, then we're at least setting the stage to have a conversation. And if we can get to that point, I'm optimistic that we can at least make some, some headway to get people to think about other points of view. And so, again, this multi-headed monster, I don't think there's one solution that any of us can sort of tell you and like, oh, I'm so glad they, they figured that out for us. That was a great <laughs> session to attend. Uh, but I think that if, if we can be empathetic and, you know, like I said, telling people you're wrong and this is why is the worst way to have a conversation. With people you need to I mean if people feel humiliated or they feel shame that is just a that is a road down to just breaking ties instead of building communities together and so I try to think about how we can as lifelong learners and people who are interested in, in the problems that we all share a vested interest in having conversations and, and trying to move forward and see where we're more alike than we are different and that's what I'm hanging my hat on so <laughs> to that is um, to be a pa vers passive versus an active consumer. Right. You can't just let the news come to you. You have to actually go out and seek it. And that also requires a healthy diet of consumption, whether it's the medical or your news source. If you're a Fox News, bury it up with some liberal now and then. If you're a liberal, then you bury it up with Fox News. I tell my students, I want you to come in and I want to see three different types, liberal, conservative, and somewhere in the middle. And if you vary that diet, you'll actually have a healthy, any doctor will say, if you vary your diet, you'll have a very healthy <laughs> lifestyle. But you'll also have to go out and act it. There are the different forms of passive. Whether you have it on your cell phone, news is coming to you. You are not seeking that out. Does that mean you have to pick up a newspaper? Yes, it does, now and then. That's actually how you can really evaluate your sources, by supporting local. Local goes to national, national break, reaches out. If you don't support local, you're going to find these edifices falling apart. That is one of the reasons why I feel the prevalence of fake news has come about, is that we have lost these ties to local communities and local news sources. And if you don't invest in them, you're not going to see that investment 10, 20 years from now. And that is what we've started to see. When you're saying 1999, we're looking at digital literacy. How many started to put their investment in online sources? We are now a generation after, and look at what that lost investment has come about. We have lost investment to our local ties and our local news, and now we have seen a prevalence of fake news. And if we don't invest on that level, whether it's at our community college level, <laughs> or just in our local towns or our local news, we're gonna see this prevalence constantly going out. So you have to be actively engaged. If you're not actively engaged, then it's just going to persist. And that's and you can't just sit on the couch and watch the news. You also have a have to diet there too, put on a different type of news channel. If that's the only active thing you can do, it's more than what most do by just changing to a different news outlet, just to hear a different voice. Because those different types of voices allow you to think more critically, more clearly about what your news is about. And it's interesting because I found, um, so my father is 80, and he is, you know, he came when, you know, where he would have multiple newspapers, right, delivered the morning and the evening. And um, I find with, his generation, they are, much to my surprise, they are actively watching different, you know, they're, they're still getting their newspaper. They're getting their local newspaper, they're getting their national newspaper, and they're watching different news sources on, you know, TV. Well, I like to watch this one for this, I get this paper for the sport. Like, it's really impressive, you know, the, the sort of the diet, like you were saying, and it's, you know, I find more with my peers, so I'm in my 40s, that some people, I'm so surprised, they're just so hooked into, well, I only watch this, I only watch that, or I only listen to this, or I only read this person, or this, and it, that was really surprising to me. And one thing, you know, we, they always talk, they always have articles, you know, when it's like Thanksgiving, and oh, you know, don't, on Thanksgiving, don't talk politics, don't, but to me, like I have family members that have very different, or are on the very opposite end of the political spectrum, but 
you know, the fact of the matter is we are related and they are my aunts and uncles. And so if you can't have a difficult conversation with somebody that you know loves you at the end of the day, if we can't even start doing that, then how are we gonna go to somebody maybe in our local community that we don't know, but is in on the opposite side of some issue that we that we care about? And if we care about it and we're out about it, and they're they must care about it because they're out about it and out, you know, about it. So why how come it's so difficult to have that conversation to get to the the you know the, the middle and come to a compromise? Um, and I feel like a lot of this fake news is so that we don't have to make a compromise. Like, it, it's, it's easier just to be like, look, they're totally wrong, and they don't know what they're talking about, instead of having a look at what we're saying and think about it critically, like I think that you were, both of you were saying, you know, and, and sort of change how we think. Um, and so is there, this is my, my next question, so is there something about our culture right now that has made this so easy? You know, forget about the social media right now. Is there anything else in our culture that has made it so easy for this to flourish? <laughs> Two things that immediately come to mind for me, uh, and especially in the libraries, I'm sure you guys find this all the time. Uh, people assume information is free. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. money yeah. That's what I mean, about. and along the same lines with when you're asking people to be local consumers, I think the, the other thing is, is that you you need to pay for the subscriptions. Like they're as as altruistic and as wonderful as journalists are, they still need to, to make a living and have operating expenses. So you have this very real idea that everything should be free on the internet and the information is free. And there's no drawbacks to that when in actuality there is because the real information actually does cost money to produce and disseminate. And then sort of the second piece is there's a level of anonymity on the internet that I don't think when you're actually having those conversations around your family dinner table are the same way. You know, I'm thinking, I think of that old far side comment where like on the internet no one knows your dog if the dog's sitting in front of the computer. <laughs> um, and so you have people who feel, this person doesn't know who I am, I, I can be as, as rude or as mean or at, you know, and, and right, deceitful. Yeah, and I think that those two very real issues have made it a lot easier for this type of stuff to flourish. It's by no means all of the reasons, but I, I think those really factor into the way people behave and the assumptions that people hold about the information and news that they encounter. Basically, you get what you pay for. Yeah. If you pay nothing, you get what you pay for, yeah. which is absolutely nothing. And that is what fake news is. It's nothing. Yes. Well, and, um, you know, people, I, I think that sort of looks like when, when there's government, you know, when a government, when the government comes out with a report, and it's like, oh, well, and it's like, no, the government is paying professionals to do this work. And so that's why it is considered a, you know, reliable or, or source because you can go back and find out who exactly worked on this, what their you know research method was, where they got their funding from. I mean, you know, every, every step along the way, and um, you, you're exactly right. It, it news information does cost money, and I, I have the, the bills to, to show you. <laughs> um, and that is a big, you know, the difference between Google and when you come to the library and we're like, hey. Here's this database called, you know, Premier, Escofo's Premier. We're paying for that, and that you know, we're paying them because they are vetting critical, you know, journals and newspapers. They're providing all of the in, the citation information. What was the news organization? Who did the writing? Who were the additional authors? I mean, there's all that information there, and that's that's very different. Then yeah, it's super easy to do a Google search, and for many things, Google is amazing. But when it comes to you know information and and, and information vetting and finding out your sources, Google is not the best because there is real there is a revenue stream that they are concerned with, and their business. So of course they're concerned with their revenue stream, and they may tout altruism or whatever, but. You know, this is a, another point that I wanted to bring out, too, really. How we've gotten to the point in time where, where mainstream media is actually a negative term. And 
the flip side of that is mainstream media a little bit to blame because you know they want as many clicks and eyeballs on their site because they have revenue streams to you know think of. Well, I think attacking mainstream media is extremely dangerous for our society. I mean, yes, some media does have a bias, and you do have to fact check a lot of it. However, the mainstream media is what keeps us knowledgeable. That's, ha that's our checks and balances. So to attack the mainstream media is detrimental to, to our society. And I don't understand how anybody could sit there and say, this is horrible, this is killing us. Like, no, you're killing us by saying that the mainstream media is, is you know, so deplorable. It's not. You just need to do your homework. How about you read past the headline? How about you actually see where the source is coming from? How about you see who's quoting it? That's really what the problem is. It's not mainstream media. Of course, like I said, there are some bad eggs, but the problem is that people are taking everything, everybody's word for what it is, and not doing their own research. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, we were just having uh, one of the reporters at, in my office working for US One, a different publication, was talking about, he was interviewing someone who written a book about how Congress used to um, spend money to investigate whether the bills that they proposed would actually work. Um, and they actually still do that, the Congressional Budget Office uh, still does that. And, and it's, I think it's an interesting question for people to ask themselves. We talk about the mainstream media because the, the so-called mainstream media say is reporting what the Congressional Budget Office says about the uh, the health the, the latest health care plan that's been proposed. The Congressional Budget Office says a lot fewer people will be insured. Uh, it will cost this much. It will do this. Well, this is I believe I, I, don't, I think I'm correct. This was an office that was instituted by Republican Congress to check Barack Obama, and now that we have a Republican president, that person is attacking this institution that was created for partisan reasons to check if the data checked out. So now we have the Congressional Budget Office saying the data don't check out. So when I just question a person who questions the Congressional Budget Office, questions the mainstream media, questions liberals or questions Republicans, why, who do you believe and why? don't believe the Congressional Budget Office, which is supposedly nonpartisan, but even if it is nonpartisan, has no reason to disagree with this Congress, why would they be not saying exactly what Congress wants them to say? It's because they believe in information. Some people still do. Um, and that's what I just ask people to do. Think about what the mainstream media is saying about that news, and then what is what do you think about it? Do you believe it? Why? Do you not believe it? Why not? And if you don't believe it, what, you know, what do you think the agenda is of the people who create that information? You can take that to any source of information. If you don't believe that news, why do you think someone else is trying to get you to believe it? I think that's a huge question. And, you know, I, I love, by the way, this idea of the mainstream media as this big organization. And I'm a chapter <laughs> of this. I, I would love to get you know the, the benefits of going to this massively powerful and surely well capitalized organization. Uh, there is no mainstream media. As, you know, yeah, the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN are always at the top of your news feed, but they're not in lockstep. And every editor and every reporter believes in information, getting to the, to the if they're doing their job right, believes in getting to the bottom of the information, whatever it is. Um, they have no agenda other than to find out what's tr as true as they can figure it out. Well, that's what reputable journalists do. Uh, and especially when we've been talking about what is fake news, you probably should take a step back to say what is mainstream media, because it's been constantly being pushed as that's a liberal agenda. By saying mainstream media, what we're really saying is liberal views. But is this idea of mainstream media coming about because of Wall Street? And Wall Street failed America, and they got away with so much money. Is that where uh, um, where ma mainstream media is also that they're failing the American populace by forcing upon this fake news? It's a way of discrediting it, uh, and we really need to tease out: Are we talking about newspapers? Are we talking about news outlets? What do we envision when we think mainstream media? And one of the things is it's probably television because that's where our eyeballs are at most of the time. And if we're looking at that, then we're looking at celebrities. 
Well, for every Anderson Cooper out there who has probably a very good salary, there are m hundreds upon hundreds of journalists who are making a tenth, maybe a fifth of his salary who are actually doing the grunt work that brings it to his desk so that he can read it. And that is the big difference that we kind of lose sight of that there are many people working really hard to get these facts. And all we see is the one individual in mainstream media, the celebrity who's getting the airtime, the popularity versus the credibility. Well, no, there is a bunch of journalists who are making sure that mainstream remains credible. And we get lost in that, in the popularity of mainstream media. Well, and that was right, that that's what, that's what is one of the, the pillars of democracy, that we have this free press. We don't have a propaganda machine you know, pushing out to the masses what they need to believe to prop up whatever government is there. You know, we have the, this inst the institution of a free press that can go and question and get do research and everything is open and there's transparency and that's one of the things that we, you know, we pride ourselves on and, and honestly it's one of the things that I love about, you know, being, working in a library because that's what, you know, libraries, that's what we feel like we, we help in that, right? We are supporting our democracy because anybody, no matter um, what their, you know, socioeconomic background, status, anything, you can come to the library and we will help you find the information. We'll bring you to that information so you can make a, you know, informed judgment on whatever. It, it could be you want to buy a dishwasher or it could be who should I vote for in the next election. So um, I think that that's, you know, for, for me, that's something that, that really made libraries very attractive and that it was a great place to work. It's so rewarding. This, this is what we do day in and day out. But exactly, it's like the mainstream media, it's like, yeah, that's why we have it. Because look, we're a democracy and they can go out and, and say like, what he said is true and I, I you know, I have these sources. And, and so um, I do think that that, that is a very good point. Um, so I, I do not have any more questions, prepared questions, but we still have a couple of minutes, so I, I would love to let the, um, our audience members ask a question uh, for the panel. Well, I have a question. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'm, I'm a daily reader of the failed New York Times, <laughs> just to, uh, to identify myself. Um, Lori brought up Pizzagate um, you know, remarks, and if you remember, and Lori could flush this out probably, it, um, it caused an individual who had bad sources to become a vigilante, and he drove his car and he carried a rifle, and fortunately no one was injured. So my question really goes to the word sources. Uh, which I've heard about three dozen times as I went around the table tonight. In, in my generation, um, a whistleblower was an ethical person who was willing to put his or her reputation on the line and a patriot and had a high standing. Today, the moral equivalent of that seems to be a leaker which has a very different thing. So my question is, is there a difference between a whistleblower and a leaker? Because these, the New York Times, for example, is constantly trying to make that evaluation. So anyone who wishes. And, and Washington Post, as well as the New York Times, what they're seeing now more, more is anonymous sources, where that was considered no, don't use anonymous sources unless you have X, Y, Z reasons to use it. I tell my students all the time, unless their life or their job is in danger, there is no reason to use an anonymous source. But, but we're getting to this point now where there's this prevalence of anonymous sources where we have 15 anonymous sources val uh, evaluating each other and making sure that it's coming through. Coming from mainstream media, what do we do with that? Do we take do we lower the bar or are we hiring the bar because we are using so many sources 
that are unnamed to make sure that the information is valid. And I think that's what the New York Times and the Washington Post have done. They're not doing just one, they're not just doing two, they're doing as many as they can. And at this point in time, these people are going to lose their job if they were not anonymous. And there could be retroactively no employment for them afterwards. So the Washington Post and the New York Times are doing their due credit by making sure that they don't just use one. They, they use as much as possible. But I think that the bar has changed drastically from a whistleblower, which would be one individual that you would use an investigative report, whereas now we are using so many anonymous sources. It's frightening, but also heartening in terms of there are many people coming out willing to, even though they're not going to give their name, they're willing to give their information. I think, uh, I think a leaker is not a whistleblower in the sense that a whistleblower usually has their name attached to it, and they're usually putting, you know, kind of what Matt is saying, they're putting their reputation on the line. And Edward Snowden, believe what you will about what he did and whether it was right, he put his name on the line. He's, he's paid for it um, in a lot of ways. You know, let's go back to the leaker of all time, the most famous leaker of all time, Mark Felt. Um, where would we be without what he did as a leaker? Um, you know, we always have to remember that um, people are not just puppets, they're not just stooges, that's redundant. Uh, they're, they're not just serving an agenda. People have consciences, just like you do and I do. Um, if people see something that they believe is not right, they're looking for a way to change things, and there's only a few of those, and one of them involves leaking. Um, you have the New York Times and the Washington Post and any other source, Fox News, cannot make people leak. They can't twist anybody, they're not twisting anybody's arm. These people are deciding to either, they're, they, either they're not very good at keeping their mouth shut, or they're choosing not to keep their mouth shut. So, um, although I, I agree a, a source that you can name uh, is better, I, I don't think that we can say that um, there's, I mean, we have to, uh, we have to face the fact that these leakers are coming forward on their own. Yes. Yeah, um, it seems to me that um, there's more of a cultural problem than a truth problem. Uh, first of all, uh, UN has done several studies on uh, corruption. And uh, one year, I don't know which year, they uh, looked to 211 nations, and the U.S. Uh, ranked 15th from the bottom. And they did another one another year, a few years later, of 198 nations, and uh, Russia ranked 168 from the bottom. And the corruption is not in what you're telling them or the facts you're telling them. It's what you said, what you're not telling. And uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, with Bridgegate, the whole emphasis was on the scandal, but there was no emphasis on the fact that extra tunnels had to be built, that every day was going to be like Bridgegate Day when they start repairing the Washington Bridge, the Holland Tunnel, and the Lincoln Tunnel. And there's just a uh, this, that, those uh, three uh, bypasses are the bypasses for the whole East Coast to uh, transport things. And um, so they didn't put any emphasis on really uh, this is the way it's going to be and why don't we build another tunnel. And I know the uh, governor turned the idea down, but maybe with some kind of political pressure it would have been done. And another one was in 2009, when Michael Jackson died. Uh, all you heard is he was the greatest uh, entertainer ever. Now, uh, how can anybody tell me who the greatest entertainer is ever? But meanwhile, the uh, president was in Russia negotiating one of the most important uh, nuclear disarmament treaties of the time. And you didn't hear anything about it. And, uh, this is something that uh, corruption that really permeates every part uh, of our culture. And money alone, uh, we're spending more money on education, right, 23rd, more on medicine.
Madison, ranked 38th. Uh, we spent 60 cents, 64 cents out of every tax dollar to make the war. We haven't won one since World War II. So what do you think the media can do to, uh, you know, change the culture? So an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I would say it is a value issue, and also with Bridgegate, someone died. I uh, uh, Bridgegate, someone died, and that's you know the scandal around the closing. They, that kind of gets lost on that. But what seems to be evaluation is if you think news is important, that get rid of the commercials during prime time hour, so that you get an hour full of uninterrupted news. That would be one way to really make I sure. Do. I watch public uh, service. Our public service, yeah. But I don't only watch the TPS, I watch Deutsche World and BBC, and I would watch RT if I thought, and Charles here is that. But they should all be. I, I would, and then they had a Polish and a uh, Italian station, but they stopped broadcasting the English. Seems like they don't want us to know the news. <laughs> I agree with you. I watch public television, uh, British broadcasting. I make a point of going to all the public lectures in Princeton, three lectures a day sometimes in different departments. I read nonfiction books and I, I find myself on so many email lists that come to me, portside moderator of them. And I read this and I read that. And you were saying earlier, be open to the notion of accepting things that you're not comfortable with. I think I came to the conclusion that I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's, that's the conclusion. Because there is so much that you are not taught. And what I wanted to say, I am finally glad that they labeled something called fake news, because at least it brings attention to people that don't have the time and energy to research and look for sources. I mean, people, the majority of people don't have that luxury. And we're not professional reporters, so you can't expect us to do, do that on a daily basis. And even when you watch public television and all the decent, you know, sources, you're still left saying, what is it that I don't know? And you really have no trust because of that culture of corruption. And at least now people can look at the notion of fake news and question. At least now people have that labeled for them that would bring them what I really feel is missing is depth. There is no depth. Everything is like headline. I mean, even when you watch, like you were saying, so many reporters work so hard to give us that, you know, uh, uh, what do they call it now, breaking news, you know. But there is no depth. There is no history behind what we are listening to or what we are hearing. And to me, that is a serious problem, because if everything is so superficial, we really don't know anything. This is a, this is a huge find out <laughs> what you need to know so that you know something. Can I get to it? OK. When I was 13 years old, and I'm worried beyond that, I went someplace with my uncle. And he was a uh, lieutenant, and he, he was in the Air Force. So I took me to Fort Dix. He says, so you want to be a teacher someday? I said, yeah. He said, and he was in World War II. He said, one thing, a war will not ruin this country, the educational system. Having the kids think that they could just play, you know, like, look this up, look, instead of what you're saying, and I thank you so much. I'm from Somerset County. I happen to have read a small article about this, and I said, should I chance this? <laughs> you know, whoa, thank you for coming out. And I'm a social studies teacher now. And it just, you, you ask them to do a current event, what they come up with. Or, you know, you ask them to read something, and they don't read the 
the whole article, I get newspapers. And I keep on telling people, what's the difference between the internet and a newspaper? Or what's the difference between an encyclopedia and Google? You turn pages. <laughs> you broaden your horizons. You turn pages and you might get stuck reading that editorial that is an opposite view, or right? looking at a, a political cartoon that is, oh, I didn't think of it that way. But when you look on your phone or through the internet, you pick out the articles you want sometimes, and you don't necessarily, and you don't read the whole thing. You just read, let's say, the headlines, and you know sometimes it's amazing how the headlines just try to grab you, and the headlines have nothing to do. We were talking about this with my family one second, and the one headline was, you know, something, you know, powerful, almost prejudicial. When you read the article, it wasn't anything like the headline. And my family was talking about it this weekend. It, it's, but thank you. And I push newspapers. Well, I think you're all sort of touching on something, something similar. And it's this idea that we are overloaded with information. I mean, it just, like you were saying, it comes at us from all angles. So sort of the bigger question is, what is knowledge, right? So we're overrun with information, but we are so deficient in knowledge. And so I think I, there's no, I can't give you the, the perfect answer for, for any of the, the, the challenges, the problems that you brought up, because they're all very legitimate ones. All I can say is that as somebody that tries to help kids do research, I always tell them, it takes a really long time, and in fact, the more you look at the knowledge that we've amassed as human beings over time, it's constantly changing. It's never settled, right? I mean, they're always, you know, you ask somebody a thousand years ago, the Earth was the center of the solar system. You ask people 200 years, I mean, things are constantly in flux and they're constantly changing. I think the best that we can do, I mean, in terms of when we're talking about how to deal with information is Find the things that we're really passionate and interested in. Try to cultivate and curate as much of that information that we actually can. And accept the fact that the more we learn, the less we actually know and the less knowledge that we have. And, and hope that the passions and the things that we're interested in will make our lives meaningful or that we'll feel that we contributed something in some way. And, and hope that in terms of like the corruption and, and everything else that, that eventually these things get brought to light and you know the people that we sort of put in roles to do their jobs will do their jobs and, and, and I mean I have to hope for that because the alternative I'm not ready to accept I'm just not ready to accept that yet I'm just not so you know I think one of the uh, you know uh, on what you're talking about and, and what actually what we're all talking about uh, that I think the internet in a way kind of double crossed us and, and I think I'm not sure it's true that there's no depth I um, my colleagues made a joke one time. I said, I, I, I'm so far behind on The New Yorker. I, I, I'm like six issues behind. He's like, yeah, The New, the New Yorker said they're going to stop publishing for a while so their readers could catch up. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> it wasn't true. But it should have been true. The thing is that there is actually a lot of information out there and a lot of depth, but it is really challenging for us to get at it. And I think to what you're talking about, I'm heartened by one thing, and it's that the internet has made some changes in our lives, or in some people's lives, in ways that have really been transformational. When we talk about LGBT rights, when we talk about feminism, Twitter and the internet are we're not there yet, but we're really making changes, and it's because these platforms are empowering people in new ways they're giving people who've never had a voice before a voice. So in how, what does the media have to do to get into the depth and to get people to consume this depth? I do think we need to figure out how, not just Instagram, but whatever is going to replace Instagram in a year or two is going to reach 
the, the next generation. Because everybody here in this room, I can tell, is very engaged and very intelligent and very concerned about this. And probably people who've grown up reading newspapers, still read newspapers and magazines, still uh, are polymaths and, and just very intelligent people. Our young people today aren't unintelligent, but they are very scatterbrained. And, uh, and yet, we've seen these changes happen with social media in some really important areas. So how can we do for, how can we take a culture that not that long ago was saying gay people should never be married to a culture that's, although many people still disagree, saying it's okay for gay people to be married. Social media and, and media help make that change. What did, what was used to make that work, and how can media use that to make news work? I think that's one of the questions that media needs to answer, is, is how to engage people and get them interested in an issue at some level of depth, so that they care and react uh, in the ways that they have cared and reacted about some social issues that have seen changes in recent years. I, I, I agree. I agree with you, and I, I have a lot of hope for podcasts because they, I feel that some of them do a really good job of getting underneath the headline and giving you that depth in a, in a way that isn't dry and is very accessible and introduces you to people that you never would encounter and, and voices that you would never encounter. So I sort of, I, I hope for that. I, I, I'm pro-podcast. I have a few comments. Uh, the phrase instant gratification never popped up. I was going to just say that. I was like, we need to slow down. Sorry, I'm a bit older. <laughs> I remember the old days with Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate with two, two or three different sources. So I'm, I'm a dinosaur, forgive me. Instant gratification, we have satellites a bombing the other side of the world. In one minute, we know what happened. Uh, the media is giving us what we want to hear. I have a next door neighbor who a, was a news writer for a major network on a very popular show between 7 and 9 a.m. in the morning. The show went from the news division to the entertainment division. So now we're getting news as entertainment from the entertainment division in a major network show. That's it. Oh, and we also have Alexa giving us the information. We don't know who Alexa is. You're right? bad jokes. I mean, <laughs> bad jokes. <laughs> but, well, well, let's try to what you said. We have a lot of our entertainment shows giving us news. I mean, I think of the John Oliver show where you get 20 yes. minutes in depth on something, right? Yeah. But that's, yes. that's sort of put it out as okay. entertainment, not necessarily as news, when actually what he's doing is a lot of Investigate. Investigate. Right. Exactly, but under the guise. So we need to trick people. It's like when you sneak the vegetables <laughs> into the... <laughs> it's, it's one of the things where satire, satire is one of those things that actually slows us down to think about how voices kind of don't mix or match up. It takes you out of your place. It makes you less passive. It makes you more active in terms of listening. But I think we need to slow down. We need to read that newspaper. We need to take the time to actually... Like, when I was getting my PhD, I had to read 200 books. Thankfully, I had the time to do it. It took a long time, but I did do it. And I appreciate having that time to really be able to closely read and evaluate my sources. And I think we're asking, even my own students, we ask them so much. Uh, they're taking multiple courses. I'm not the only course. How do we slow the bombardment, whether it's media and we're a consumer, how do we do we just turn off the television, step away, actually get involved with their community to find out what's going on in it by being involved in it, volunteering? Sometimes the best news, and this is with any news, is a primary contact with the individual. And look, that's what I found um, to be the, the good side about all this. I mean, while I think labeling everything um, as fake news is very dangerous to society, What's good about it though is that it's forcing some people to actually look beyond the superficial and see what's actually going on. Of course, there are some people who will still never do that, and that's when we get into that dangerous territory. But I've realized that there are a lot of people who are now getting much more involved in politics, who are getting a lot more involved in you know the actual statistics. Um, so that is the silver lining of it. So I mean, it's just evaluating the sources. I mean, and. Yes, the internet is part of the problem because we have an influx of information. But then there are great websites like Fact Check that you can, you know, you find something that seems, you know, amiss or maybe something that you really believe you want to believe. 
and then you type it in and you find it is not. There was um, this one meme that was floating around for a while that I'm sure most people are familiar with. It was like, um, President Trump was saying something in 98 that um, if I had to run for president, I'd run for a Republican because they're the dumbest voters or something to that nature. And the person who wrote it, who wrote that meme, said it was accredited to People. It turns out that People magazine had no recollection of it that was not in any magazine whatsoever. And it was really just somebody who you know, had an agenda to push and that got floated around. So hence, the, hence the expression character assassination. Yes. Okay, I could say I saw you with a strange man and you're married with three children coming out uh, kissing in a movie theater. Because I said, put it on the internet, it's true. And there's character assassination to, to the end degree. Yeah. See, but the skepticism that we experience now is doing some good. So that, that's definitely the silver lining to it. Okay, our last comment, because we are running out of time, is for the gentleman right there. Do you see fake news in, in this country as a function of politics and the political process? Or have you seen it transcend into other areas of American society and culture? I don't think I see it as a process of, uh, you know, the political agenda. I think a lot of things are just misunderstood sometimes. I, that, that's what I really think it, it comes down to. A lot of times, like, like I was saying before, I mean, I guess it could be a, a political agenda. But with the whole thing, like when we're doing, um, like, the health care reform, and people are like, oh, well, you're going to get a tax break. I don't know if it's necessarily fake news. It's it may be an agenda, but you know we have to research what is this based on. What what, what where does the source? What does it come down to? So I, I don't think it's always all intentional. You know, a political push. Of course, some of it is, but I think on some level we have to wonder how sophisticated both parties' propaganda spin machines have become. And obviously, Steve Bannon is in the White House, used to work for uh, media companies. So um, that's that's an, it's a question that I can't exactly answer, but I, it's a question worth asking. Is, is, is what yeah, what level of infiltration is there in the, not the media but the news cycle from partisan politics? And yep. the, once you actually implant doubt in someone's mind, it's really really hard to take that away. I mean, you think of the tobacco companies that basically said, we don't need to say that the science is, we can just say, we're not sure. You can just say, we're not sure if climate change is man-made. You can just say, we're not sure if tobacco causes cancer. Um, and so we're not sure <coughs> if the, uh, the MMR vaccine causes autism. And then once it's out there, even if there's a lot of information that comes out that refutes it, the doubt is there, and so the doubt is insidious, and the doubt is is tricky, and I'm not exactly sure how we deal with that when it's very easy for people with particular agendas to capitalize on that. But I think some people just want to believe it. Like, very true. Right. That's really what it comes down to. There is this one story that was circulating on the uh, social media for a while now, um, and I remember I got excited when I first read it too. It was. Um, something that President Obama was coming up with this whole thing to get rid of everybody's student loans. Somebody with student loans, I'm like, hell yeah. But, but, then, but then I'm like, wait, this doesn't make any sense at all. Like, how are you gonna rid everybody of student loans? That's detrimental to, right? So, um, everyone was circling around, I'm like, where did this come from? So I, I did some research, and it was just a satire, or satire article that just got circulated. It was from a joke website that people are passing along this news, but you want to believe it's true, so then you start passing it along, and then, hey, that's, your fake news is born. So, and then if you hate Obama, then you're like, well, this is dumb. But then if you love Obama, it's like, well, this is great. <laughs> so. And it may have started off with politics. My fear is that it's going to continue in seeding doubt at every single level, not just politics, but every stage of the game. Um, on the plus side, maybe we'll look more closely and try to seek out the truth. I hope we're just less passive, and that's the only hope that they use to make us active consumers of our news outlets. Well, thank you. Thank you so much.